All right, we're going to get our second panel started. Welcome back, everybody. So again, my name is Alicia Varani. I am the director of the criminal justice program here. Thanks again to everybody for being here. Uh, this panel this morning will discuss how to address public health and police violence concerns in a world where there is a fundamental right to carry a concealed weapon post-Bruin, particularly in situations when police confront legally armed people of color. Throughout history, people of color, especially black communities in this country, have felt a legitimate need to arm themselves in self-defense, as protection from police brutality, as well as for protection from white supremacist violence perpetrated by civilians. These legitimate fears persist today. And yet the specter of the gun has been used to justify the shooting of hundreds of black and brown individuals by police. Our first two panelists, Julie Martinez-Diaz and Professor Brennan Marquez, will address the issue of police violence and comparative self-defense claims in police-civilian encounters in the post-Bruin world. We will then turn to professors Krishnamurthy and Salib to discuss their paper, Small Arms Races, and the implications of the Bruin decision on everyday street-level interactions that have the potential to escalate given the relaxing of open carry laws. I will briefly introduce our panelists and then turn it over to them. We have Julie Diaz-Martinez of the Check the Sheriff Coalition. She is a graduate of UCLA, holds a master's degree from the School of Architecture and Urban Planning, her career has been in the nonprofit sector of development of affordable multifamily housing. She is an activist for families impacted by police violence, focusing on the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department as a member of the Check the Sheriff Coalition. Then we have joining us on Zoom, Professor Brennan Marquez, a professor at UConn School of Law. He teaches courses in constitutional law, policing, evidence, and law and technology, and he directs the Center on Community Safety, policing and inequality. Professor Brennan Marquez's research explores how the legal system organizes and processes information from surveillance and data collection to the use of evidence at trial. Uh, also joining us on Zoom is Professor, professor Krishnamurthy, Associate Professor at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. He is an associate, uh, he, his research interests are in criminal law and procedure, constitutional law and anti-discrimination law. Prior to his academic positions, he practiced in Los Angeles and clerked for the U.S. Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, and the California Supreme Court. And last but not least, we have Professor Peter Salib, Assistant Professor at University of Houston Law Center uh, and Associated Faculty at the Hobby School of Public Affairs. His research applies economic and technological tools to resolve constitutional and other public law problems. So thank you to the four of you for being here today. Um, I'm going to ask um, Julie to start us off. Um, if you can talk to us about your work with the Check the Sheriff Coalition, the strategies that you're pursuing to protect communities from gun deaths at the hands of police, and about your grandson. Okay. Um, thank you. Can everyone hear me? I'm incredibly honored to be here. And um, as it's stated, I do not have a law background. I have worked in um, immigration reform with ICE out of California to end ICE detention, all ICE detention, and most importantly, working um, for families that have been impacted by police violence. Um, I don't have a law degree, but my daughter is um, her first. She's in her first year at uh, Berkeley Law School. And you know my niece here, she's working here at UCLA. She graduated from Berkeley Law as well, as well as my older sister. So we're half Bruins, half Bears. So, um, you know, the, I can't really speak about the, the technicalities of the court case, but I can talk about how families have been impacted by police violence. Um, one of the com components missing from this ruling was the uh, effect on the quality of human life. And it's very disconcerting to me to understand that, that um, people are legitimately afraid of being in public spaces. And um, I don't know how many of the people here in this room have been impacted by police violence, but it's happened on two personal levels for me. 
Uh, I had a neighbor who was killed in the borderline shooting, which occurred in the Thousand Oaks area of California, and my grandson was uh, killed. So bear with me, because it's, um, I'm going to shorten the story, but basically, he's an 18-year-old who lived uh, minutes from one of the most dangerous uh, law enforcement agencies on the planet, and if you don't already know, that's the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department the largest sheriff department in the nation, the most violent, has the largest budget. He attend, um, He with a friend went to a dispensary and was very cognizant of the fact that as he and a friend pulled out, um, a sheriff was following them. Uh, he lived minutes from the area, so he knew the streets very, um, very instinctively, He was actually traveling on the street that he grew up in, in um, the East L.A. area. And so they knew that the sheriff was following in the back. Sure enough, they got pulled over, which happens to many people of color who are patrolled by the sheriff department. And his friend who was driving um, made the mistake of triggering the sheriff who pulled them over and asked, why am I being stopped? And the sheriff said, um, I'll paraphrase it, but basically shut the fuck up, um, if I want to, I'll blow your brains out. And um, they proceeded to pull the driver out. Um, by the way, there was never any um, citation ever given. They claimed it was running a stop, but as you know, if you're a person of color, you don't run a stop when there's a cop following you. And um, they proceeded to pull my son out of the car. The statement from the sheriff is very different from the um, uh, uh, eyewitnesses, and unbeknownst to the sheriff department, there were two very young um, people, young teens, that were fairly hidden in the shadows and were filming the entire event. So um, the sheriff's version is that my grandson, who's five foot two, weighed about 120, as anyone knows, you're an 18 year old, still a kid, that he was attacked and um, was facing an attack, and my grandson ran. And um, we can discuss why people run from cops, but he ran and then was shot within a minute. So within, within three and a half minutes of this routine traffic stop for a basic citation, he was shot and killed. Um, the sheriff did claim uh, that he was hit, although the video footage later showed that there was no attack no physical um, confrontation with my grandson. And um, since that time, I have been working very closely with a group called Check the Sheriff. We're a coalition, and I wanted to highlight the, um, the, the groups that are involved. It's really important that I include them. It was spearheaded by Andres Kwan of ACLU SoCal, uh, some of the some of uh, the groups in our large coalition are say, say their names: Black Lives Matter LA, Reform LA Jails, White People for Black Lives, Dignity and Justice Now. I could pretty much go on and on. Centro CSO, but what we what we have been doing, we have been focusing on drawing attention to the unlawful killings and the unlawful violence that has been inflicted upon communities of color in Los Angeles County. So much so that we have, we are the author of Measure A, which is, I know this is a topic later on, which we will discuss some of the things that communities can do to to hold uh, police in power. So with that, I'll move on. Thank you, Julie. And and I know everyone here is so sorry for your uh, incredible loss. Um, thank you for sharing that with us and all of the advocacy that you've been involved in here in LA County. Um, so I'll turn it over to Professor Brennan Marquez um, just to build on what Julie has just spoken to us about. Can you talk about the varying legal standards for self-defense and how these may protect the police rather than civilians in gun-related incidents? Sure. So, hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good? Okay. Um, so, uh, what I'd like to talk about a little bit is um, where the uh, authority for police 
police violence comes from or how the legal system sort of imagines that authority. And it's very, you know, it, 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 it's um, very germane to the tragic story that we just heard, which we know is kind of all too common. Um, it basically, uh, I think, is a historical matter. The idea that police, as the enforcers of criminal law, exercise legitimate authority um, to use force in certain situations was kind of understood um, originally as an outcropping of the of the more general kind of authority that the state exercises when it subjects people to criminal punishment. So there's an idea that we can debate about exactly when punishment is warranted and how much punishment is warranted, what kinds of stuff should be criminalized, but that the state has at least some degree of authority uh, as long as it does things like complies with due process, it proves its case got a reasonable doubt, it passes the law in a legitimate way in the first place, and so on and so forth, to subject some of its citizens to purposive pain and suffering in the form of criminal punishment. And that the role that the police play in that process is that they're sort of the, the first, the first uh, um, uh, dominant. Like, they start that process when they see a crime ongoing in public or when they have a warrant, uh, or then they perform a traffic stop, potentially. Um, and then from there, um, the consequences that could follow from an encounter with the police of that form, as long as other conditions are met, is uh, criminal punishment. And because that criminal punishment is a kind of authorized sort of violence, that the police have some kind of derivative authority to use violence under certain circumstances. For a variety of reasons that I won't elaborate here, but I'm happy to talk about people who are interested, but I've written a little bit about others written about, I think that account of police authority just doesn't really work that actually we need an idea of police authority uh, if, 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 it, if, if police power is going to be a legitimate thing in a sustainable way. We need an account of police authority that, that, that derives from elsewhere. That it's not enough to just say, look, the police are the kind of the first step of the criminal justice process or the, or the, or the criminal punishment process. And so because of that, they have some authority to exercise violence. The kind of violence that the law permits them to exercise is way too capacious uh, and broad and has too many detrimental consequences to be justified on that basis alone. So then the question becomes, how do we justify it? What is the kind of ultimate source of police authority to exercise violence? And I think what we have seen over time is that the law has developed a different account, and not just the law, the popular discourse about this um, has developed a different account of where police authority exercise violence comes from, which is a kind of self-defense idea. So the police, when pressed to explain why their uh, exercises of violence are justified, or when courts pressed to explain why um, force is going to be understood as kind of consistent with the parameters of the Fourth Amendment and other legal regimes, they say, they basically point to the fact that police can be in the line of fire. And then the question becomes a factual one about whether the police were actually in the line of fire. As the story we just heard from Ms. Martinez indicates, you know, that, that uh, in practice um, can uh, mean that the police get to uh, tell a story about what happened and their experience of being in the line of fire that may or may not line up with the actual reality or what the other perspectives on what happened are. And we know that that's an issue, but in principle, there are going to be times when the police are going to be in the line of fire and are going to correspond and they have right of self-defense or defensive others. What I would say about this, and I'll leave it there, is that that's, that's, that should be startling to us, even though it's also very common as an argument for where police authority comes from, because the self-defense or defense of others kinds of arguments are ultimately arguments that we have historically talked about as licensing violence from anybody, whether or not they are police. So there's an idea that traces in political theory back, I think, to Thomas Hobbes, but has many manifestations since then, that if anybody is put in a situation where they are in, afraid for their own lives or they are kind of called to duty to protect uh, the life of another third party, that they then have the warrant and the law will afford them a kind of immunity to 
consistent with that warrant to exercise force against others in ways that would otherwise be unjustified and would otherwise be criminal acts. This is the conceptual basis of the justification defenses that you're all familiar with from, you know, first-year criminal law. Uh, okay, so why am I talking about that in connection to the Second Amendment and government itself? I mean, clearly it's connected in, in the sense that we know police violence is connected to what's kind of going on in a real-world way. But I think there's a conceptual and jurisprudential connection here, too, which is that that very source of greater authority to exercise violence that I was just describing, the justification defenses, self-defense and defense of others, is exactly where the court has sort of grounded its understanding of the existing Second Amendment regime. So the reason why, under Heller and now Bruin, the Second Amendment is such an important kind of hallowed right in the eyes of the Supreme Court and many of its intellectual sort of defenders along these lines is precisely the way in which it is connected to the right of every person as a citizen, as a rights-bearing entity, or as a Hobbesian subject, I would say, to engage in defense of themselves and defense of others, paradigmatically in Heller in the context of a home. But now we see in Bruin that actually, of course, the boundaries of that can expand because there are many places in the world where one might feel under threat. And so what we're seeing, I think, in some broad sense, is that the justification for police violence on the one hand and the justification for robust Second Amendment protections for private persons on the other hand are actually are actually merging together in a very deep way. And, it, and, it, and this, should, this, should, this should give us cause for lots of reasons, but the one thing I'll leave you with is that it, it suggests, given that these arguments were developed in political theory in the context of trying to describe what distinguishes a civilized legal order from a state of nature, and Hobbes' whole idea was that at the moment where somebody comes after you and threatens your life and threatens the life of somebody near you, we are put back into a position in a state of nature, that there's a sense in which the whole regime here is actually uh, uh, revealing an understanding of the world sort of laden with firearms that is essentially a highly technologized state of nature that we are susceptible to at all moments, at all times, whether we are civilians or police officers, and it's a kind of violent free-for-all uh, that really can be unbound in some deep sense by law, and that that should be very scary to us. So I'll end there. Thanks, Professor Brendan Marquez. So I'll pass it to Professors Christian Murthy and Salah. That was kind of a perfect segue into uh, your your paper. So talk to us about sort of this, you know, uh, ever increasing fear around ordinary civilian encounters um, and, and the increased concerns for safety in this sort of shoot first climate. Yeah, so um, I agree. I think that's a great segue into um, a discussion that uh, Guha and I want to have. So, um, so of course, uh, we, we know that in a, in a world where there's a more liberalized access to firearms, we will see more instances of uh, shootings and killings that are motivated by animus of various kinds, including um, racial animus. Um, but uh, in, a, in a short essay Guha and I published uh, last year, uh, we argue that the situation is, in fact, uh, maybe much worse. Um, we uh, sort of draw on uh, game theory and specifically the game theoretic models that um, economists and uh, political scientists developed in the middle of the 20th century to think about uh, the nuclear arms race and the, um, uh, the threat of uh, not only the development but the use of nuclear weapons uh, between nations uh, to model the threat of the use of small arms, of guns. Uh, and the basic idea is that, um, of course, we should worry about what you might think of as uh, bad actors who want to do violence against others and uh, giving uh, increased access to guns will enable that. But in a world where there's more uh, access to guns and relatively few um, uh, restrictions on how they can be brandished and used in self-defense, that you might get a lot of violence between people who, in fact, uh, don't have these kinds of invidious attitudes and don't, in fact, want to hurt anybody. And so to understand this, you can think about just um, uh, this, this sort of vignette that you see actually in you know, Thomas Schelling's book on game theory from, uh, from the middle of the 20th century. Um, so suppose you wake up in the middle of the night uh, hearing a sound in your home 
and you sort of venture downstairs and you see someone's broken, broken in um, and you know, you see that they're armed. Imagine, in fact, you also own a weapon. Um, but imagine what you don't know is whether this person who's broken into your house is simply there to steal some things and leave or whether they're there to commit a murder. Um, so uh, you have a choice to make. Do you... Um, do nothing and hope that they'll leave, or do you go and retrieve your weapon in case you might need to use it? Um, it's a pretty easy choice. It's much better to have your weapon just in case than to not have it and be shot first in the instance that this person wishes you harm. But of course, once you have your weapon, now the other person is in exactly the same position as you just found yourself in. The question is, should that person uh, now retreat and risk being, I don't know, let's say, shot in retreat, um, or should they, I don't know, uh, unholster their weapon in case they need to use it before you. Every escalation not only puts the other party in the position of deciding whether to escalate further, it also increases the risk of accidental shooting, where accidental simply means one person misreads the other party, thinking that they're about to be shot, and then shoots first, right? And so we can see this is a classic arms race. It's a subspecies of what we call a prisoner's dilemma, where people who in fact don't um, intend each other harm, can end up um, acting in ways that are worse for everyone than what everyone wants. And Guha and I's basic argument is that in a world post-Heller, in a world post-Bruin, in a world where states have increasingly um, uh, liberal um, rules for who can get guns, how quickly they can get them, how many they can have, uh, where they can carry them, whether there are penalties for doing things like um, uh, unholstering them, brandishing them in a situation where they might uh, plausibly feel threatened. Each of these is an instance where you might, say, put the brakes on an arms race. Um, and in every instance, the uh, trajectory of the law uh, appears to be uh, against putting the brakes on these escalations. And we think that that's quite a dangerous world to find ourselves in. I'm happy to add just a few things. Um, so in the paper, we discuss the case of uh, the McMichaels and, uh, and, and, uh, and the killing of Ahmaud Arbery. And um, in that case, we, you know, in our discussion of it, you know, so for those who do recall that case involved uh, Ahmaud Arbery, who was running in a neighborhood and uh, the um, McMichaels um, and followed him in a truck uh, and to confront him, to sort of ask him what he was doing there. Um, and uh, in, this was videotaped and, you know, ultimately uh, they, they do confront him. Uh, Ahmad Arbery, who was unarmed, tried to grab the gun, you know, um, because he was fearful that they were trying to assault him. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, one of the McMichaels uh, shot and killed him. Uh, shot and killed on uh, Arbery. And uh, as of in, in the, um, you know, they, the McMichaels were charged criminally and they were, they were convicted. Um, and in part, you know, uh, it was jury verdict, so we don't know exactly what the jury was thinking, but some of the key facts that we know from the case is that, uh, that Ahmad Arbery was unarmed and that the McMichaels knew that, um, and uh, that Ahmad Arbery had not actually not committed a crime uh, at all even though that's what the McMichaels claim to suspect, but they have no evidence of him committing a crime. And uh, that Ahmad Arbery hadn't taken any violent action towards them, any violent or threatening action towards them. Um, but Peter and I observed that, you know, had the keys gone a different way, had any of those facts changed, uh, you know, um, then it, there is a plausible argument that, you know, the McMichaels would have been acquitted. Um, or at least not convicted, because it's going to require unanimous juries. Um, and furthermore, that um, even under the facts as they were, it's possible that they would have been acquitted just because of how the law works. Um, and we kind of draw that out. And Professor Alec Whalen has also uh, presented a pretty, pretty uh, convincing argument that the acquittal might have been in the offing. And we think that's really, really bad. Uh, and that the regimes, uh, you know, including standard ground laws and, you know, uh, 
liberal laws on how you can hold your gun, who can possess it, and, you know, uh, and brandish it, etc., really contribute to this kind of uh, state of nature, as Professor Ben Marquez is pointing out. Uh, you know, in, in I think we sort of say that it's a kind of return to the wild, wild west, who can draw quickly, draw more quickly. Um, and there's a kind of related point about police uh, violence here, too, which is that as uh, gun laws and, you know, um, these kinds of, uh, you know, regimes of, you know, uh, guns, uh, you know, expands, um, it's, you know, it's rational for police to think that everyone is a threat, and therefore this may license police engaging in war, you know, sort of violent and brutal behavior towards citizens. And so far from, uh, you know, uh, creating, uh, a, you know, a more robust self-defense right, uh, these kinds of laws just make everyone more dangerous with respect to private citizens against private citizens, but also private citizens against the state. And uh, that is also just, you know, a, a sort of dreadful outcome of this. So I'll stop right there. Thank you all. So I want to just pick up on that point. So it being rational for police to perceive a threat, but then also now we have a regime in which it is lawful to be carrying uh, concealed weapons. Um, can we talk about sort of that tension and how, how we might see that playing out in these police civilian encounters? Anybody who would like to respond? I'd, I'd like to say something. Yeah. So um, we've been, even though we're, we're very local, we focus on the sheriff, our coalition called Check the Sheriff, um, we, it's centered on families that have been impacted by violence because their stories are so, so important and so valuable. And um, so I will say that um, I have pages, I mean, I have boxes of stories of people, so it would take me a half a day to even get through and explain, but our perspective is that um, police um, don't need a gun, don't need the pretense of a gun, don't even need a pretense of a weapon. So what we see with this ruling is that um, it will be um, devastating on communities of color. Already, I have so many um, stories. I want to just highlight one because this young gentleman, Sawandi, was at a was at a train station, and there was some report that uh, there was somebody brandishing a gun. They immediately profiled him. He was shot once, running from the police as they attempted to speak to him. Remember, there was no crime committed yet. He was never identified as the person who had the gun. And then he was shot seven more times um, when he fell to the ground. Um, the gun that Sawandi allegedly had in his hand was registered to an Almani Reserve police officer. And unfortunately, when they staged the scene, they were unaware that um, he was left-handed and they had put the gun in the right hand. So from our perspective, from people who are advocating for families of, uh, affected by uh, violence, ours is specific to the toxic, you know, historically toxic, violent culture of Valley County Sheriff. Our perspective is you don't need a gun. With this ruling, we foresee far more stories of families impacted by violence. I mean, I could... Can I say, oh, go ahead, Kyle. So, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Here you no, no, you go ahead. I was just going to say something in response to the last part of the question that Alicia framed it about the tension. So, because I think this is super important. Like, there is no tension, actually, in the sense that the lawfulness of somebody carrying a weapon or otherwise uh, enhancing their threatening capability, whatever that means, having a robocop suit or bodybuilding or whatever it is, in this case it's a firearm, does not impact the, 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 um, uh, uh, the underlying legal regime here in a conceptual way. Of course, it changes the fact patterns that we are likely to see, but the background legal regime, which is drawn from this kind of object understanding of what's going on at the moment when people are under threat, is that if you are under threat for any reason, as long as it's reasonable, I and mean, we're going to ask questions on the facts about the reasonableness of your position and stuff, but as long as it's reasonable, if you feel under threat for any reason, no matter whether the threat is of a lawful or unlawful origin, 
your enhanced rights under the law are the same. So there's never going to be a question under like self-defense, you know, jury instructions or whatnot. Was the thing that was making you afraid for your life lawfully originated or not? Uh, now, juries, as as Ruha was kind of pointing out, it's sort of, you know, juries as they actually engage in these cases on the facts, and as we as the, the court of public opinion, so to speak, actually engage in these cases on the facts, of course, there's going to be a difference. But I think it's an important point to emphasize because it's not. It, it, the, 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 the backdrop against which any reform in any direction is playing out is one in which we have imagined that there is going to be the potential within the context of kind of civilized life, normal social life, these exceptional moments that have the characteristics of the state of nature in the sense that you are sort of brought back to some kind of original state where the only thing you can do as a rights-bearing entity and indeed a fundamental right you can never be alienated of is your ability to protect yourself. And so that that's just, that's the legal system that we are working with and that we've been working with for hundreds of years. This has deep roots in the common law. And so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not resisting all the spirit of what you're saying, Alicia. I think it's a, bad, it's a bad thing, or these are all reasons why we should be super wary about any move to liberalize any aspect of the, you know, uh, acquisition and use of firearms in any way for all the reasons that the other panel has said so nicely described. But like, it's not intention. There's nothing, this is actually the system kind of playing itself out in a certain way according to its own teleology in the sense that, you know, if you see the ability to individuals to protect themselves as the background inalienable right that kind of structures uh, the entire social order, that there's a way in which a lot of this actually, in a perverse way, makes sense, in that the Wild West model kind of uh, is, in a certain way, a vindication of this set of political theoretical creases. This is why we see that there's a whole right-wing imagination, like in movies like Taken and like across the board, of the moment where you have to step in to protect yourself or others as the moment where you are almost kind of vindicated as a subject. It's almost always a white male subject, but it's kind of the every, you know, the universal subject. Like, there's a whole way of thinking about this that sees kind of that moment of encounter as like part and parcel of like what kind of defines our political life. And so, anyway, I think, I'm not saying that, it, that like, I think that in the, in the, I get where you're coming from and where a lot of folks are coming from, and I actually come from probably the same place as the policy matter. But like, I think it's important to, to emphasize that there's like nothing, there's, there's nothing kind of uh, at cross purposes here from a certain perspective. Like this is the legal regime that we have had and that we are gonna continue to have to work with and that should make us even more sort of circumspect perhaps. So I'll sort of disagree with Kyle. I mean, I think maybe he's, He's right that this is kind of the logic of, of self, self-defense as like a, a legal theory. But um, part of the point of Guha's and my paper is to just show that policy matters and it matters to, uh, it, policy generates or, you know, you know increases or disc- decreases the number of situations that exist in the world where uh, people are going to uh, rationally, rationally or, or at least truly subjectively feel that they need to defend themselves. So to your question, um, uh, uh, there is, uh, at least as a matter of fact, I think a kind of tension here because on the one hand, if you are a um, person of color who is in a neighborhood where you know that the police are armed and at least some subset of the police, um, for example, are going to target you unfairly and maybe be more inclined to use violence against you, then you might have a perfectly rational reason to yourself be armed. Right, and then so the more uh, that is the case, uh, the more even those police who don't have this kind of uh, invidious attitude towards, say, people of color, um, are going to be uh, uh, rationally aware of the fact that the people who they meet in the uh, in their the course of their duties are likely to be armed, and uh, and and here we see again this this like reciprocal spiral of um, of uh, of of arming yourself and then escalating the use of your weapon if you do encounter somebody else who's armed. And, uh, and then, you know, eventually we get to the situation where um, people um, have, you know, say, pulled out their guns and each rationally feel that they, um, 
uh, are under threat of life. And we have this kind of state of nature that, um, that, uh, that, that Kyle identifies. But like policy can change that. Policy can act like far upstream of that moment, right? Policy can affect uh, how cheap it is to get a gun, right? So I have a paper where I've argued for uh, a Pogovian tax on guns, um, the idea that you should have to internalize the costs, the risks of your gun ownership, even if you want to um, use it to defend yourself. But there are many other things you could do. Um, you could, for example, reinstate the duty to retreat uh, rather than these kinds of more, more newfangled sp uh, stand your ground laws, which, which um, many states have enacted. This um, effectively increases the cost of escalating of let's say like you know, pulling your gun out rather than retreating from um, the, uh, the potentially heated situation. And this can like, you know, avoid the context in which the, the, the parties, uh, one or more of the parties uh, have kind of like a rational incentive to actually use their weapons. So, so, um, so I do think that as a matter of fact, um, there is, I don't know if you'd call it, call it a tension or if you'd call it a sort of like suboptimal game theoretic um, set of incentives, um, but uh, but I think that does exist given the policy we have, and I think different policies would generate fewer of those incentives. And I'll just say, like, I'm open uh, to the possibility that like those who are ushering in uh, these like sort of liberalization of gun policies that are leading us down the spiral are uh, doing it with the purpose of getting back to the model of West in mind, right? And maybe that's their actual purpose. But I also suspect there could be a different story, which is that, you know, people think sort of like, you know, narrowly, oh, if I liberalize these policies, actually what I would do is make a, a, a world that's safer for me because I'll be able to protect myself. And they aren't actually taking into account the things that Peter and I are pointing out, which is that, you know, there's, a, you know, Everybody gets to do that, and that makes us all uh, less safe. And I think that there might they might also be overlooking, right? We see this in this discourse about you know liberalization of gun laws being important to uh, preventing tyranny of the state, right? This does seem like a narrow-minded thing, right? Because the state just has so many more weapons than you know any particular individual. Even local police forces are so so militarized, uh, and you know they have SWAT teams and all this kind of stuff. They have all this military equipment. You know, the Second Amendment doesn't prevent government tyranny in any way, and I do think that's maybe um, evidence that this isn't uh, the design of getting back into the wild wild west, but rather just a, a narrow view that mistakes <laughs> that mis mistakenly uh, you know overlooks what all the other actors will be doing in response to, you know, liberalization of gun policies. Professor Brendan Marcus, I want to give you an opportunity to respond also. Oh, just, I, that all sounds right and plausible on, on the facts. Like, uh, that's sort of, I, I, I tend, you know, I don't know about who I know Peter's an economist by instinct and training, and like I'm, I, I tend to think that there are there are sort of broader political tropes here that have to do with a, with with the kind of romanticization of the idea of self defending subjectivity that are inextinguishable, and that you input all the facts that they're describing, and you tell people all about the game theory model and. And that doesn't touch any of this, not just because people don't pay attention to news or whatever, but because it's like it's not actually what's at stake in this set of ideological movements. But that's a non-falsifiable sort of claim that has more to do with my own disciplinary background than anything else. But I'm not sure how much we actually disagree about, you know, if you gave us a piece of model legislation to talk about, I think we are likely to come down in roughly the same places. And I, I think we agree with that, right? Uh, our model is like the most optimistic model. It's a model where everyone is like completely rational and informed and like doesn't have fantasies about defending themselves. And part of the point is supposed to be even then uh, a legal regime where it's very easy to get a gun and there are very few restrictions on how and when you can use it. Even then a lot of people get killed. And so I think Kyle's point is just, look, it's, it's even worse than the even worse situation that Guha and I claim we're in. 
And I'll add to that the principle of irrationality that our paper doesn't tackle, but we acknowledge is racism and bigotry. And that's the kind of irrationality where, you know, these liberal gun regimes will lead to, you know, uh, black and brown and poor people feeling the brunt of police force in response because the fact that there are guns out there, I think, may lend to a situation where police feel empowered to take violent action more quickly because they can point to a kind of broad rationality to this. Look, it's very dangerous out there. What do you want us to do? And who's going to face the, you know, as a factual matter in our world, who's going to face the brunt of that? I think we know who, right? Black, brown, and poor communities. Yeah, I want to turn back to Julie, but then all of the panelists about some of the, the solutions that you propose. And one thing I just want to throw in as I was doing research for this panel, I saw a recent article in the LA Times about how the LA County Sheriff has been boasting about how many concealed carry licenses he's issued um, since he's been in office. And then the LA Times uncovered how many of those were his donors, in yeah. fact. Um, so yeah. can you talk a little bit about yeah. that and then the, the solutions that you all are working towards? Yeah. So the Democratic, uh, supposedly Democratic reform candidate, which is why myself included, many of us in Los Santos voted for Villanueva, um, turned out to be um, a red hat wearing, just very alt-right sheriff. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is concealed carry is very racist because he, the, a good, a significant amount of the concealed carry permits were given to his own donors. So like-minded people like him. But I just want to go back really quickly because we bantered the word about the wild, wild west. So for communities of color, it's already like the wild, wild west with the police. It's already, they're already massive shootouts. It doesn't take a lot to trigger policing and communities of color. So I think, I'm not quite sure because I'm, I'm not in the research or projection, but I believe other communities that are non-communities of color will be experiencing what community co of color have. Um, because as I explained, I don't have the time or the capacity to, to um, explain all the different cases where police do not need a pretense to shoot, to shoot us. And I say us because it does affect my family. Since um, 2015, approximately 6,600 people have been killed by police. Since that time, only 18 were ever convicted of manslaughter and four were convicted of murder. So there's zero, absolutely zero, zero accountability for, for policing. And then to address your issue about um, things that can be done, um, I take, look at it from an activist point of view. So we're out in the streets. We don't miss a board of supervisors meeting or a civilian oversight meeting. We're talking about, about uh, police brutality. We're talking about this. Um, our power is in, is in our grassroots movement. We've been able, when um, the toxic environment of the sheriff department, the most violent sheriff in the nation, um, when we first proposed that there were deputy gangs, we were met with disbelief. No one would use the word gang. They would only use the word click. We now have the Board of Supervisors and the Civilian Oversight utilizing the word gangs because that's, that's what it is. You know, it is a gang. Um, things that we can do that are positive are police reform. Post uh, George Floyd, we had California, led, every California legislator, every political uh, political elected official was talking about uh, reform. And yet the California legislature in 2021, it was, went out with a fizzle. Although 2022 has seen a huge change in the amount of laws. I, um, things like uh, prohibiting arrest techniques um, that create risk of potential asphyxia, minimum standards for law enforcement, most important you know, police uh, decertification rules. And I want to, I know this sounds sort of contradictory, but I'll leave you with this. I haven't polled police officers or cops, but if I did, I would find, despite who they vote for 
overwhelmingly. They do not like this ruling. This makes their ruling, this, this makes their job far more dangerous. I don't, believe, I don't believe that this is a comfortable ruling for them because now they will be um, approaching every stop with the assumption that people are caring. So. Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> Um, do you want to talk about some of the, the solutions that you, you touched on them briefly, um, but expand a little bit on the duty to retreat, the expansion of self-defense? Yeah, so um, so so the question is, uh, if, if there are these um, perfectly rational kinds of incentives to, um, if, if you know that everyone else has guns, to get a gun, to... Uh, carry it with you in places where you might encounter somebody with a gun uh, whom you don't know whether they wish you ill or well to um, <clears throat> to brandish your gun if you see somebody else who has one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how do you head off that cycle of escalation? How do you stop the arms race? Uh, and the answer, Guha, and I think, is that we have to make at least some step or steps of escalation more costly, right? The whole reason that this this uh, cycle happens is uh, at each moment uh, it's m more costly not to escalate than to escalate, right? It's better to be ready to shoot than to be shot um, because there's very little cost to the, the steps you take to be ready to shoot. And so we think that the solution has to come in the form of some kind of friction, some kind of break uh, in the in the. Uh, long string of actions that might lead you to uh, one of these escalations. So where can that come? Uh, it can come at any stage, right? So for example, it can come at the stage uh, where people ask themselves, should I go get a gun, right? I hear that there are more guns out in the world. Uh, I might encounter somebody with one. Um, maybe I should go buy one myself. Uh, in many states, it's just very easy to do, right? There are some background check requirements. Most people can, um, can pass them, um, but you kind of pay the market price for a gun and you get it more or less right away. So um, you could uh, slow down the escalation at that stage by doing something like making guns more expensive, you know, making them available mostly to people who had a particular uh, sense that they needed one to, uh, to defend themselves beyond the kind of ambient threat of meeting someone with a gun. Um, but you could also uh, put the brakes on by making other kinds of escalations more costly. Um, one of the ones we focus on in the paper is this difference between... Um, a duty to retreat versus uh, the uh, right to stand your ground. Uh, for most of the history of um, the common law, there was a duty to retreat uh, before using deadly force. So if there's a reasonable way that you could get yourself out of even what looked like a dangerous situation, right? You're in a situation where you already think you might be under threat. Uh, you nevertheless had a duty to try and get out of that situation if it was reasonable to do so. Um, in the past, uh, couple of decades, we've seen states institute the opposite rule, the rule that says you can stand your ground, right? You don't have a duty to retreat if you think you might be in a dangerous situation. There's no legal liability if you stand your ground and then, you know, uh, things escalate out of hand. Um, so Guhan, I think one productive reform might be reinstituting duties to retreat in any of the states that don't have them um, anymore. Uh, one of the reasons we think that, uh, we wrote this paper before Bruin came out, um, but one of the reasons we thought that at the time, and it's only more relevant now, is that uh, this is a historical, uh, historically rooted uh, legal regime, right? It was always the case that you had a duty to retreat until recently, and under the uh, new uh, history first test that Bruin gives us, uh, those kinds of legal rules uh, rooted in history are the ones uh, most likely to be upheld as constitutional. Uh, so we, we think at least that is a promising approach. Uh, but we also talk some about things like um, uh, different states' rules for what counts as uh, a, an assaultive threat, right? You, you pull your gun out to show that you have it uh, and, uh, and that you can use it. Uh, well, in some states, that might be considered a threat, uh, and you might be liable civilly or criminally. But in other states, uh, it might not be. And uh, we think that um, uh, erring on the side of making that a costly thing to do, i.e. risking some legal li liability, would be um, uh, an another one of these ways to sort of put the brakes on the cycle of escalation. 
And I'll just add one point to that, which is that you might think, okay, well, what what happens when a person is genuinely, uh, you know, like faced with a threat and they pull out their gun and, and you know, take um, evasive action with, by lethal force? Are they, by the regimes that we're suggesting, uh, you know, now guilty of a crime? Uh, and no, the answer is, is not, not the case, um, because they can still have, uh, you know, necessity defenses and, and, and self-defense claims. Uh, so, you know, which is it, right? Which do we want? Well, here's one point that we, we want to make, which is that keeping, the standard, keeping it a standard rather than a strict rule actually may force individuals to be cautious because they don't know which side of that they will fall on as the system plays out. We don't know what juries are going to say. We don't know if prosecutors are going to decide whether to charge it or not. Um, and actually, that itself may give some friction to make escalation more costly. If a person doesn't know whether their action is going to be criminal or not, uh, then they might take more caution to ensure that they don't take legal force when it's unnecessary. Professor Brennan Marcus. Um, yeah, I just say that I think the police violence problem is very unlikely to be solved in any sustainable way until we until we rethink um, the labor structure and in particular the role the unions are currently playing. So like a big part of this, I don't mean to downplay the situations that um, you know, Julie's talking about and there are plenty of departments that are uh, poorly run to the point of sort of rotten to the core. There are also plenty of departments that are run by people who tend to be um, more, relatively speaking, uh, cosmopolitan and kind of loyal to their sensibilities. Um, I emphasize relatively, but who are, have no managerial capacity as a practical matter. So like, I spend my time across the state of Connecticut, talking to Italy, it's Connecticut, and I don't Connecticut, but like, talking to police chiefs who say, I don't need help identifying who the problematic officers are or what the problematic situations are that we can write down on a piece of paper and put into a training or like sort of at a tactical policy level try to contain. Uh, the problem is I can't actually implement any of the practical protocols that would be required to really contain this problem. Pulling people from certain beats and certain jobs, actually getting enforceable sort of tactical changes like on the books. It basically it's like if I have a bad apple officer or many of them in my ranks, I am effectively uh, a strange actor. This is of course a very easy line for people in the leadership layer of any organization to take because there's a lot of Peter and others can tell you about the economic kind of sort of like like from that perspective they have lots of different incentives besides dealing with bad apple officer or whatever, but I think this is a real phenomenon, and that the problem fundamentally is that when I say there should be managerial capacity, what I mean is that it, there is a there is a different structure, a a labor structure in place that in other settings is a really good idea for lots of reasons, but in this setting it's actually proven to be a terrible idea. That means that the people who are at the supervisory layer that would be able to deal in a granular way with problematic individuals and policies and be able to strike the right kinds of balances that get the trade-offs, you know, roughly correct, are essentially unable to do so. And until we change that, I think there's, it, it, it's going to be very, very um, difficult. I mean, the other thing is, like, some of this is very hard to answer because the world is so compromised. Like, we, you know, like, what's the answer to gun violence and for, like, police violence in particular? It's to basically, every time the police kill somebody, the, the gun manufacturer should have to pay $5 million into a, into a public fund of some kind. Like, the Pagubian thing is a great idea in some sense for the individual gun owners, but they're not even the main actors. It's like, you know, George Carlin had a routine a long time ago that he was, he was joking, but it was like joking in a way that points up reality. Like, you want to deal with drug trafficking? Every time there's a drug bust, like, 
take an investment banker and execute them. <laughs> like, you do that, and the problem is going to go away within a calendar year. Right, because it's like, that's a joke, or that's a joke, that's a pop humor. But the idea is like, you make the elites feel it. You make the elites feel it, and the problem will go away. Everything is pressing in the other direction. We've been unable to do gun reform, the Supreme Court, and blah, 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 blah. So, like, I don't know. It's sort of, I think real change is going to be you either empower the people who are, I'm talking about the police question in particular here, who are at the layer where they can really effectuate things on a very granular level, which is actually sadly not true with things of state legislatures, or you make the elites who are able to insulate themselves from the state of nature thing entirely actually feel the cost of it. Because I agree with Julie, like this is coming to communities and our communities of color, which have long experienced something like the state of nature, but it's not coming far enough because it's not coming to the gated communities. It's not coming to Jeff Bezos on his island. And like, that's where you have to actually focus your efforts in a longer term way. You know, that imparts a whole lot of other political questions. I'm going to ask one more question of the panelists and then uh, turn it over to the audience. Um, it's a, a little different, but um, you know, since this panel we're talking about public health implications of the ruling, um, when we consider what protecting public health means, are there hidden costs of gun violence that people might not usually consider um, that could be a result of Bruin, so, such as those affecting bystanders, children growing up in an environment with um, more both access and witnessing guns in the general public? How might seeing more guns in public affect the mental or physical health of gun violence victims, their loved ones, and the country at large? I'll start. So communities of color are already suffer from lack of uh, health, basic health care issues. So if you have um, health care that's not responsive to your needs, you're more than likely not going to have mental health care associated with whatever plan you have. Um, Black and Latinos are twice as likely to be impacted by gun violence themselves or family. Black community are 12 times more likely to be a victim of gun violence. And children and communities impacted by shooting gun violence, even just two to three blocks away, are twice as likely to end up experiencing PTSD. Um, from my perspective, from what I see, people that are impacted by unlawful violent acts by police, there's a, a tremendous amount of trauma. It's, um, it's horrific. And the reason I know so much about it is I'm involved with Check the Sheriff, and it's, it's centered around families impacted by violence. So this ruling is, is horrific. It's just, it's just horrific. The, the um, reverberations throughout the nation, um, I don't even know how we would ever come to solve it. If we don't even have... If we don't even have basic health care for communities of color and they're already suffering from trauma and the trauma of a shooting and a violent act like this, it has um, terrible consequences. So this I don't even know how to solve. And from a family that was impacted by violence and saw the trauma in the family, um, it's, it's, it's very, this uh, ruling is very, very hurtful and very painful. So, so I would just add to that, um, from the perspective of public health, you know, we've been talking a lot today about uh, gun violence, and um, one thing that hasn't come up yet, I don't think, is that, um, so, so people die, about as many people die every year in the United States from a, a gunshot wound as from an auto accident. So it's like, you know, a, a tremendously large number of people. Um, but one thing that I think hasn't come up is that the majority of those deaths are suicides, um, not homicides. I think it's not actually very close. I think it's something like two-thirds of those deaths are, are suicides. And we have at least some evidence that there's a causal relationship between having a gun in your house and, uh, and killing yourself. Um, the plausible mechanism is, you know, so, this, so there's evidence that, um, uh, so, so, Men commit suicide at much more much higher rates than women, um, but it turns out that men don't attempt suicide at much higher rates than women. Um, they just uh, succeed um, much more often, and it turns out that that seems to be because they use a gun uh, predominantly, whereas you know uh, w women tend to use um, uh, other means that are less lethal. Um, 
So like, what does this say about gun violence and public health? If uh, we live in a world where people have liberal access to guns, if that's a world in which more people then feel the need to themselves own guns uh, in case that they uh, encounter somebody who means them ill, who has a weapon, it might just turn out that uh, that's also a world in which we see many more suicides uh, because people who didn't otherwise have guns in their house, who might be depressed, who might be suicidal, who might otherwise attempt suicide in a way that's less likely to actually kill them, will then instead use a gun and they will actually die uh, and we will see um, that as a maybe, maybe the most important public health um, impact of you know, increased levels of gun ownership. Professor Brennan Marquez or Christian Murthy, anything to add before I turn it over to the audience? Oh, I think the answer was no. Okay. Um, audience questions. Yes. Uh, well, a, a JD is technically a doctoral degree. Uh, people look down on us calling ourselves doctors. <laughs> Uh, so let me see if I understand the question. So, um, so, uh, so you point out that the, the first example you gave, it's actually you know, it's Thomas Schelling's example, and he's really talking about nuclear weapons um, and using guns as an example. We sort of invert um, the example in our, in our paper. Uh, you say, look, that's in the household, right? Um, and I think there's a legitimate question. Okay, in this, in this relatively narrow range of circumstances where someone's in your house, like, does it really make sense to have... Um, a duty to retreat. I'm not sure the answer to that. Um, the answer might be even if you do have a duty to retreat, if you're already in your house, it's not clear where you'd retreat to. So you've like maybe satisfied the duty insofar as like, you know, where are you going to go? Um, the question of uh, being out in, uh, in, in the world where there are many places to go, um, um, potentially uh, a, a duty to retreat that requires more, will that make the world more dangerous? Uh, our view is uh, no. Um, because uh, it will require not just the police, but everybody to uh, hesitate more before using their weapons. Um, of course, you say, look, there are going to be situations where, like, somebody does mean another person. You know, this, this is, these aren't, like, benign actors who have unfortunately found themselves in an arms race and have accidentally shot someone, but there are people who are out there, um, you know, with intent to harm, intent to, to commit a robbery with a, a weapon, or maybe an intent to murder from, from the get-go. And um, the duty to retreat reply, uh, applies when it's reasonable to do so, right? So uh, insofar as you're uncertain what a person's um, uh, intent is, uh, imposing a duty to retreat makes it less likely you're going to escalate in a case where that person um, doesn't mean anyone harm. Um, but if you're in a situation where it's clear that somebody is I know, robbing somebody else, right? Um, then that kind of duty wouldn't apply. Now, will there be like like hard cases? Will there will there be different kinds of um, of, of error costs, right? Where people aren't sure what kind of a situation they're in. Um, certainly, right. That's like the nature of legal rules. None of them um, none of them gives people um, uh, the ability to like d decide without without error. But but we think what we think is the case is that um, when you have uh, less incentive to branch your weapon, stand your ground, et cetera, when it's not clear that um, the other person means you harm, we think that that will lead to many, many fewer cases where um, people um, end up in sort of accidental ex escalations, escalations where like nobody really wants to shoot anybody. 
And so while there may be some, some number of, of sort of errors where, where there's, there is actually someone who means harm when the police or the person being threatened actually should have stood their ground, there may be more of those, those incidences where the, the, um, the, stand, the, the duty to retreat law means that there's harm that happens in those cases. We think that'll be like vastly outweighed by the reduction in um, instances where people uh, who don't really want to end up shooting anybody uh, would otherwise end up shooting people. We think it's a better equilibrium, not that there are no errors. Yeah. I guess this question is primarily for Julie, but it can also be open to all the panelists. Um, and especially looking from a criminal justice lens of hoping to look, imagine a future of abolition what does justice look like to your family or to communities, all these stories mm -hmm. of people that have been murdered by mm -hmm. the sheriff or by police across the country and in LA? Mm -hmm. what, what does justice mean to you and mm -hmm. your family? Do you want to see prosecution of cops? What do you want to see you know, cops in jail? What what does justice look like mm -hmm. in that sphere? Thank you for asking that. The former uh, uh, DA Lacey prosecuted one cop in her entire six years. Um, as, as a stopgap immediately is the legislation that has occurred within the last year. California legislature have really gone out and um, really stepped up in the meantime. But the overwhelming policy stance from the majority of people that I come across is we are for abolition. We, we don't believe in police reform. It doesn't work. The entire system needs to be dismantled. It was never, it was never based on equality or justice anyways. So um, we will never see you know, justice in the form that we want to see it. The, um, thank you for asking. The officer, who uh, the deputy who shot my grandson, it was rumored and told to me that he was a gang member within the East LA Bandidos. And um, for a lot of people, I'm, and I call myself guilty, I didn't know that there was that many gangs in, in the law enforcement. And it turned out that there was a whistleblower who um, was interviewed on CBS major news story and identified the shooter of my grandson as um, a gang member. There's, there's, no, um, there's no justice. There will never be justice because you can't bring a life back. Um, the frightening part about discovering the, the gangs within um, the, is that for communities of color, these shootings, this gun law, people, we already know there's no, we, uh, officers don't need a pre, cops don't need a pretense for shooting communities of color. Just the fact that they have to say a brown, a black person, and um, indigenous, Pacific Islander was intimidating to them is enough for them to be, um, for it to be justifiable. Frighteningly enough, within our community in East LA, um, gangs are there's a it's a trophy for them to shoot people. Um, it was also discovered is that they have deputy um, tattoos, which to us feel like a really easy way to identify and root out bad cops. But Sheriff Ian Wave is claiming that they have it's a First Amendment right to free speech. But these um, these tattoos are ever evolving. So every time they shoot commit an act of violence, and kill. They have a trophy. Their tattoo is added upon, which is, is, which is quite disgusting. So, and your answer is there is no justice. To me, justice would be, um, would be a breakdown of the entire system. Policing doesn't work. You know, and that's, that's my personal opinion and the opinion of many of the um, people in my advocacy group that are working to um, root out um, the tremendous amount of violence that exists within policing in communities of color. Thank you, though, for that. We have a question back there, and then Adam. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess my question is for uh, Peter, and you mentioned one of the potential solutions being um, re moving back to duty to retreat in lieu of stand your ground. And one of the concerns that I have with respect to more people carrying guns is that all of the self, traditional self-defense sort of um, uh, 
you know, uh, restrainers, whether it's duty to retreat or necessity or proportionality, they all get diluted, right? Because if the other person has a gun, it will more often than not be unreasonable to make somebody retreat because as um, the, um, our friend in the back room mentioned before, you can shoot at range. Um, and so in places like New York, where both people have the gun, have a gun, look for cases where there's still, where the courts and juries still impose duty to retreat and find that somebody did not properly exercise self-defense. I can't find them. So even in places with the duty to retreat, where everyone's armed, that limitation on exercise of force actually gets diluted, as does necessity, as does proportionality. And um, because lethal force is going to be proportionate, for instance, to the threat of lethal force when everyone's armed. And so I guess one of the questions that I have is whether or not it would be look, it, it would make sense to look to even more aggressive changes to the law of self-defense, burden shifts and, and the like. Do you consider other changes that might be um, maybe bigger steps toward changing the incentives? And are there counterweights that you think might counsel against making those big changes? And again, burden shift is the one that really comes to mind for me, but maybe there are others. Uh, yeah, so uh, good good point. I think uh, I think that's right. Um, uh, my view, and I think Guha probably agrees with this, is that like, uh, yeah, m more, more, um, more, um, I, don't, I don't know if drastic is right, the, word, the right word, more, more, yeah, requirements with more teeth uh, would, would be better. And um, I think our view is also that, um, Policies that, that sort of head off these kinds of escalations are, the, are, are better the earlier they occur in the cycle of the escalation, right? So um, as you say, uh, by the time you're face-to-face -face with somebody else who has a gun, um, not only are these traditional rules like duty to retreat going to be harder to give teeth to because, of course, maybe it's often reasonable to not retreat um, from somebody else who's armed, um, it also might be like uh, more costly to impose the the, um, the 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 burden at that point, precisely for these reasons that the gentleman in the back said. Sometimes the person really does want to shoot you, right? And if you impose the dirty retreat, then then you're more likely to get shot. Contrast that with like say um, making guns more expensive, right? So it just turns out that there are many few people walking around with them. Uh, then then uh, you don't run into this sort of dual problem of the legal standard being diluted, and also that increasing more, like I say, costly errors in these situations where, where someone might actually want to kill you. Now we can talk about like, okay, maybe it would only be people who really want to shoot people who would then have guns, but at least seems, uh, it at least seems better. Uh, the reason we focus, I think, on the duty to retreat versus stand your ground is really just this historical reason. Um, that's the, re you know, we, again, we wrote the paper before Bruin came out, so even under like the, the Heller regime, it seemed like, I don't know, can you put a tax on guns? Can you change self-defense such that there's like um, you know, less of a self-defense exception to, um, to, to, uh, to homicide liability? I don't know, Heller says some stuff about that. Um, can you impose a duty to retreat, but it's like uh, not the reasonability standard, but it's like the, you know, uh, the no other alternative standard or something like that. I don't know, those are all, 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 all reforms that I think we, we think could be productive. The question is just like, given all the stuff you guys talked about in the last panel, uh, is, any court, is any court gonna, well, is any conservative court and or the conservative Supreme Court gonna uphold a rule like that? Yeah, and I'll just add a quick point. You know, we do think it's an empirical question and you just may be totally right that with the number of guns out there, uh, these like, Stand your ground, changing all that is not going to put the brakes. It's not going to be the necessary brakes. And then we would have to move to one of the more extreme solutions or even more drastic or you know, bigger step solutions uh, like getting guns off the streets. But then, you know, there's the, there's the unfortunate constitutional obstacles. So we don't know if we're, you know, we don't know what will happen with that, but that's totally better. Adam, last question. I am. Um... I certainly, you know, we at Giffords work on enacting strong gun policies around the country. I certainly agree that the earlier in the cycle, you know, you can adopt these policy reforms, the better. I suppose if there's any silver lining in the Bruin decision, it's that 
doing something like reimposing the duty to retreat. There's, there clearly is a, you know, uh, a strong historical basis for doing that, so theoretically even a conservative court might uphold uh, those policies. Although I think the more practical re issue or problem is that the state legislatures or other legislative bodies that you would theoretically need to move in that direction as a matter of policy, I think, are unlikely. So um, I think there's sort of the theoretical basis for, for the paper, I understand, I think, makes sense. I think there's some really significant practical and political challenges to, to actually implementing those policy solutions in the states that, you know, have gone in the direction of saying here. But my question was following up on, on Rand's question about, you know, what does justice look like in terms of prosecuting cops, in terms of, you know, criminal justice system and uh, these bad actors in law enforcement. I wonder if any of the panelists have any thoughts on the civil justice system and ability to, uh, uh, you know, bring some some form of justice to victims of police violence in particular, if any of the panelists have any uh, comments or perspectives on qualified immunity and the role that plays and the need to reform uh, qualified immunity to try and bring justice to the civil justice. So, so qualified immunity might be another s silver lining. Um, as you may know, there is a sort of movement in the legal academy and in the sort of judiciary to question uh, the validity of qualified immunity as like a legal doctrine. Like, like is it real or was it just made up? Uh, one notable thing about that movement is it's bipartisan uh, in a sense. So um, the I think that like, you know, paper that kicked off the discussion was a paper called Is Qualified Immunity Unlawful? It's by a guy named Will Bode. He teaches at the University of Chicago. He's thought to be, he's an originalist, first of all, like, you know, like the majority of the Supreme Court now uh, says they are. Um, he's by no way, means a bleeding heart liberal, and he's like the, um, the, the torchbearer for abolishing qualified immunity. Um, and I think, you know, other people who think of themselves as originalists, who think of themselves as conservatives, think he's maybe right. Uh, and of course, people who think that for instrumental reasons, we should hold police accountable civilly for, 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 for beating people up and killing them, also think that's a good idea. So yeah, maybe we will get some, uh, some reform of the qualified immunity law. And uh, yeah, that would be good. Although for some of the reasons Kyle said, it's not totally clear uh, given the given the question of who actually pays the judgments when you sue the cops and uh, the extent to which you can or cannot, as a police department, um, fire the police officers who are costing a lot of money in civil judgments, uh, you know, may not go as far as we'd hope. I would just say that civil ju judgments are costing LA County residents in the billions, and it's absolutely ridiculous. And um, if you ask family members, they want to see these these cops um, convicted. I do know many families have you utilized the, the uh, judgments and have turned around and opened up nonprofits that advocate for people of, of violence. So that is one. That is one silver, small silver lining in it. But we, if you ask them, they want to see convictions. They want to see them fired, and they're not. Re, um, they're not fired, and in fact. Um, uh, California now has the decertification, whereas before people can go wherever they want. Once they were fired, that, that's gone. That's ended as of um, January 1st next year. And um, it's just frightening to find out the uh, history of violence that these officers, or police, sheriff, and their history of violence. And they, they usually have a paper trail, and they're never fired. So justice would be them to be removed and not just removed and um, retire with a huge uh, California <laughs> pension, but also um, be where they should be, which is in jail for unlawful, unlawful violence and lawful murders. Last thoughts from our Zoom panelists, and then we'll close out. Oh, I just give a plug here again for like the idea of finding ways consistent with the extant legal regime and political climate to like make elites actually like feel the cost of some of this stuff. 
is like in a very concrete level when it comes to civil judgments for all the reasons that Julie just said and Peter alluded to too. Like, like okay, it would be great because qualified immunity was clearly nonsense, like all along. It was made up by the very people who were arguing for textualism in other areas or whatever. It's just like like overlaid upon 1983 for no reason at all. Um, and I'm glad we're recognizing that. That's that's lovely. But like the result is going to be that at best you have complicated indemnification and insurance schemes in the background that mean that the risk is distributed more widely. And at worst, and in most actual cases, what you have is the municipality is sort of, which is to say like the people, like the local, you know, the uh, local tax bases on both sides of the ledger here. And so it's not, it, it like it might satisfy our sense that qualified immunity is a kind of um, needless barrier to, to satisfaction or redress, which I think is a real thing, but like, in the end, any of these reforms that are focused on on reallocation or like distributive effects at a more kind of local level as between the individual officers and their victims or between individual uh, perpetrators and victims of gun violence and Pagovian stuff, like it is is uh, at risk of missing the larger picture, which is like the, the people who can keep themselves like you know, I, I, I don't want to go like full board eat the rich here, but it's like the people who keep themselves insulated from this as a practical matter need to start to feel some of the cost of it for there to be, I think, lasting change. It's not the only way change happens in, you know, it's thousand points of light, but like at a structural level, I think those kinds of reforms are much more, are much more important in some sense than reconfiguring what private individuals in a kind of private order in style way using traditional torts, in this case constitutional torts, can do to kind of get redressed from one another because that's really reallocation in a bounded way that is like not going to engage with some of the broader political economy of this. I mean look, it's like like the gun manufacturers are just like running away with, you know, they're just it, it's a massive expropriation that's now constitutionally shielded in a variety of ways. And that doesn't solve the problem, it just diagnoses that way. But like I think that's just in some fundamental way the best way to understand what's going on. So the question becomes, how can we actually respond to that given the constraints of reality? I, I'll just add one very quick point. Um, you know, one, and we also need officers to feel the repercussions. And you know, um, Ben Grunwald and John Rappaport did uh, some good research in this uh, article called "The Wandering Officer," where where they showed that officers who were fired for, you know, bad behavior um, uh, were often rehired in other departments very close by. And so, you know, there has to be meaningful repercussions for, you know, um, bad behavior by officers um, through either tortious judgments or, you know, like gay fire, you know, uh, and actually not coming back into the profession. All right, thank you all so much for um, contributing to this panel today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Our next step is lunch out in the courtyard, and we'll convene back at 1.30. 1.30.